Hello, I'm Dr. Carly Pond, clinical lead at Biomsite. This video is a part of a series where I walk through how a practitioner would look at sample results. Before we dive in, I need to remind you that while I am a doctor, I am not your doctor. The information in this video is for educational purposes only and is not intended as medical advice. Please speak to your healthcare provider before making any changes to your healthcare. I also wanted to highlight a few special topics related to the microbiome. These are some areas to look at depending on symptoms. So first, let's talk about methanogens or methane producers. So that will be in the pathobionts section. So we will be talking about methanobrevibacter. So if you are suffering from constipation, you will want to pay special attention to methanobrevibacter. This is an archaea, which is actually a different type of microbe than bacteria, that produces methane gas. Methane gas slows down transit in the gut, leading to constipation. So methane can be very tricky to reduce, and we are still learning more about this. As a condition, we are now referring to it as intestinal methanogen overgrowth, and this can occur in the large intestine as well as the small intestine. This test does not test for the small intestine, only the large intestine. So the current go-to treatment in the integrative world is high-dose allicin, which is a specialized extract of garlic. The antibiotics neomycin or metronidazole have also been used, but they, of course, can have some detrimental effects on other parts of the microbiome, so they may not always be the best tool. Other potential tools are oregano oil, neem, soy isoflavones, l ruteri DSM-17938 probiotic, and partially hydrolyzed guar gum. So I have found these tools to be hit or miss in my patients, so more research is definitely needed in this area. Some of you who are familiar with intestinal methanogen overgrowth may have heard about using statins, but I just want to point out that this only works in the test tube right now. So current statin medications are not effective in humans as they are absorbed in the small intestine. So the statins aren't actually reaching the large intestine to have this effect at lowering the methanogens. So researchers, I believe, are working on a formulation of statins that would deliver it to the large intestine, but those are currently not available. So the other special topic is going to be histamine. Now, if you have histamine intolerance or mast cell activation syndrome, MCAS, your microbiome may be playing a role. However, these conditions are multifactorial and complex, so the full scope of that discussion is actually outside of this test. So certain bacteria in your gut can make histamine, but it is important to note that 16S sequencing cannot accurately assess the histamine production by the microbiome. This is only assessing for who is present, not necessarily what they are doing. So the accurate assessment for histamine production from your gut would be to actually test for the genes that can make histamine. So not all these bacteria, even though they could make histamine, are they necessarily actually making histamine? So as you can see, certain proteobacteria species like Klebsiella or Morganella may produce histamine, but you can also see that there are some beneficial bacteria like Bifidobacterium and Lactobacillus that can also make histamine. So the other big group that can make histamine is going to be Streptococcus. If proteobacteria or streptococcus are elevated, aromatic herbs such as rosemary, ginger, oregano, and thyme can be helpful. For streptococcus, peppermint can also be helpful in my clinical experience. Now, histamine from the microbiome is generally only a problem for symptoms if the gut barrier is impaired. So that's also known as leaky gut. If there's low butyrate production, or if there is an issue in the small intestine microbiome, which again, small intestine issues cannot be assessed by stool testing. Now, for mast cell activation syndrome, 
The problem is generally not necessarily high levels of histamine producing bacteria. Rather, it is your mast cells being triggered to release their own histamine. And usually the role that the microbiome may be playing with that is through the LPS levels. So if you have elevated proteobacteria, that could be playing a role in triggering your mast cell activation syndrome. I typically only see this being a really big driver of mast cell activation syndrome when the proteobacteria are overgrown in the small intestine or if there is a fungal overgrowth somewhere in the gut. So both of those issues are beyond the scope of 16S stool testing. The next area we want to talk about is beta-glucuronidase. That's going to be found in the detoxification section. So if you struggle with menstrual symptoms or imbalances in your sex hormones, your microbiome may be playing a role. So your body gets rid of sex hormones through the liver and the gut. The liver will attach some things to the hormones to deactivate them, and then they stick the deactivated hormones in the bile. The bile will be dumped into your digestive tract at your next meal, where the hope is the deactivated hormones will be eliminated via your stool. But some bacteria make enzymes that can reactivate estrogen. So this is the beta-glucuronidase enzyme. When estrogen is reactivated in the gut, it can be reabsorbed into the bloodstream, and that can result in higher levels of estrogen, which can cause a variety of symptoms. The most common bacteria to produce this enzyme is bacteroides. So make sure your bacteroides levels are healthy. Again, it is important to note that 16S testing does not directly test for beta-glucuronidase. It only tests for who's present. So it's identifying potentially known bacteria that could make beta-glucuronidase. So this is essentially an estimate or a potential for beta-glucuronidase activity. 